In this video, we are going to provide a brief introduction to the CQRS pattern and how the .NET Library Mediator helps us build software with this architecture. If you prefer reading about it, and also if you want to download the source code, feel free to visit the article on the Codemaze blog site. The link is in the description below. The Mediator Library was built to facilitate two primary software architecture patterns, CQRS and the Mediator pattern. While similar, let's spend a moment understanding the principles behind each pattern. To explain CQRS, let's use the diagram from our article. CQRS stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation. As the acronym suggests, it's all about splitting the responsibility of commands and queries into different models. If we think about the commonly used create, read, update, delete pattern, usually we have the user interface interacting with the data store responsible for all four operations. CQRS would instead have us split these operations into two models, one for the queries, read operations, and another for the commands, create, update, and delete operations. The CQRS pattern makes no formal requirements of how this separation occurs. It could be as simple as a separate class in the same application, all the way up to separate physical applications on different servers. The decision would be based on factors such as scaling requirements and infrastructure, so we won't go into that decision path today. The key point being is that to create a CQRS system, we just need to split the reads from the writes. So, what problems do we solve with it? Well, when we design a system, we start with data storage. We perform database normalization, add primary and foreign keys, add indexes, and generally ensure that the write system is optimized. This is a common setup for a relational database, such as SQL Server or MySQL. Other times, we think about the read use cases first then try and add that into our database, worrying less about application or other relational DB concerns. Well, neither approach is wrong, but the issue is that it's constant balancing act between reads and writes, and eventually one side will win out. All further development means both sides need to be analyzed and often one is compromised. CQRS allows us to break free from these considerations, and give each system the equal design and consideration it deserves, without worrying about the impact of the other system. This has tremendous benefits on both performance and agility, especially if separate teams are working on these systems. After CQRS, let's talk a bit about the mediator pattern. To explain it, we will again use the diagram from our article. The mediator pattern is simply defining an object that encapsulates how objects interact with each other. Instead of having two or more objects take a direct dependency on each other, they instead interact with the mediator, who is in charge of sending those interactions to other party. We can see that some service sends a message to the mediator, and the mediator then invokes multiple services to handle the message. There is no direct dependency between any of blue components. The reason the mediator pattern is useful is the same reason a pattern-like inversion of control is useful. It enables loose coupling. As the dependency graph is minimized and therefore code is simpler and easier to test. In other words, the fewer considerations component has, the easier it is to develop and evolve. Now that we've been over some theory, let's talk about how the mediator package makes all these things possible. First off, let's open Visual Studio and create a new ASP.NET Core Web API project. We are going to name it CQRS Mediator Example. And let's uncheck the Open API support. And click Create. After the project creation, we have to install a couple of packages. First, let's open the Package Manager console and install the mediator package. Next, let's install a package that wires up mediator 
with the ASP.NET DI container. To do that, let's use the install package command and call mediator extensions Microsoft dependency injection. Now, right after the installation, we have to configure our mediator package in the program class. So let's navigate there and add builder.services.addMediator method. Of course, for this, we have to add the missing using directive. Then we can call type of and provide program as a parameter. Now mediator is configured and ready to go. Before we move to the controller creation, we are going to modify the launch settings.json file. Let's modify the application URL property to 5001 for HTTPS and 5000 for HTTP. Now is the time to add our controller. Let's navigate to the controllers folder, choose add controller, let's select API, empty controller and add a name products controller. With our controller in place, let's first just modify the route attribute from a generic controller parameter to products. Now, to be able to use mediator in our controller, we have to add a private read-only iMediator mediator field. The iMediator interface allows us to send messages to mediator, which then dispatches them to the relevant handlers. Because we already installed the dependency injection package, the instance will be resolved automatically. But we have to mention something. From the mediator version 9.0, the iMediator interface is split into two interfaces, iSender and iPublisher. So even though we can still use the iMediator interface to send requests to a handler, if we want to be more strict about that, we can use the iSender interface instead. This interface contains the send method to send requests to the handlers. Of course, for the notifications, you should use the iPublisher interface that contains the publish method. That said, we are going to use the iSender interface instead of iMediator and also let's rename the field to sender. Also, let's generate the constructor that initializes the field and let's make it a one-liner. Now we can continue. Usually, we'd want to interact with a real database. But for this video, we are going to create a fake class that encapsulates this responsibility and simply interacts with some product values. That said, let's open a solution explorer and create a new class and name it product. We need two properties here the public int id and the string name. Now let's add another class and name it fake data store. Here we start with the private static list of product and name it products. Then let's add a constructor. We want to initialize our products list with the new list of product and add a new product with the ID one and the name test product one. Then we can copy this row and paste it two more times. Let's modify the ID to two and three and also modify the number in the name to two and three. Now we need a couple of methods. First, let's add the public async method that returns task. And let's name it add product. 
it will accept a single product parameter. Inside the method, we are going to use the products list and call the add method with the product as a parameter to add a new product to the list. Also, since our method returns no value, we will await task.completed task. The second method is also going to be public async, but it will return task i enumerable product. Let's name it get all products. As an implementation, we will just await task.fromResult and provide our products list as a parameter to return. At this point, we want to return to the program class and register this fake store as a service. To do that, we'll add builder.services and call the add singleton method to register the store as a singleton service. Now that our data store is implemented, let's set up our app for CQRS. To start with it, let's create three new folders in our solution. So let's add new folder with the name commands. Then let's do the same and name it queries. And finally, the last folder with the name handlers. We'll use these folders throughout the exercise to separate our models. Now, let's talk about the most common usage of Mediator, requests. Mediator requests are very simple request response style messages, where a single request is handled by a single handler. Good use cases here would be returning something from a database or updating a database. There are two types of requests in Mediator. The ones that return a value, queries, and the ones they don't, commands. To start with, let's create a request that returns all the products from our fake data store. In the queries folder, we're going to add a new class and name it get products query. Let's remove this, make it a record, and inherit it from the iRequest interface that accepts iEnumerable product as a parameter. This simply means our request will return a list of products. That's why the iRequest interface has that parameter. Then, in the handlers folder, we are going to create a new handler class to handle our query and name it get products handler. To make this class a handler, it needs to inherit the iRequest handler interface. We also have to provide two parameters for this interface the get products query, the query that we want to handle and iEnumerable product as the type we want to return from our handler. Now, let's implement the interface and leave it as is for now. Since we are going to use this handler to return the products from our data store, we have to add a new private read-only fake data store fake data store field. Then, let's implement a constructor and Let's make it a one-liner. At this point, we can move on to the handle method implementation. We can see that it returns the task i enumerable product and has two parameters, the request of our query type and the cancellation token. The only thing we are going to change here is to make it async. Now, in the method body, all we are going to do is to return all the products from our store by returning await fake data store dot get all products. If we want, we can make it as an expression body method. To call our request, we just need to add the get products action in our products controller. So, 
let's add the HTTP GET attribute first. Then we need a public async task action result action with the GET product's name. Inside the action body, we will return all the products by calling await and then using the sender variable and the send method where we provide a new get products query instance as an argument. Lastly, we will return an OK result with our fetched products. That's how simple it is to send a request to Mediator. Notice we are not taking a dependency on fake date store or have any idea on how the query is handled. This is one of the principles of the Mediator pattern and we can see it implemented firsthand here with the Mediator package. Now, let's start our application and let's use Postman to test it. We have a prepared request and all we have to do is to send it. And we have our result. This proves that Mediator is working correctly as the values we see are the ones initialized by our fake data store. Now, to continue our video, Let's talk about the other type of mediator requests. Command. To create our first command, we are going to add a request that takes a single product and updates our fake data store. So let's navigate to our commands folder and add a new class. Let's name it add product command. We have to remove this and replace the class with the record. We'll provide a single product property and we want this record to inherit from the iRequest interface. Notice this time the iRequest interface doesn't have a type parameter. This is because we aren't returning a value. Take note that due to the simplicity of this example, we are using a domain product entity as the return type for our query and as a parameter for the command. In real-world apps, we wouldn't do that. We would use DTOs to hide the domain entity from the public API. If you want to see how to use DTOs with web API actions, you can watch our handling get requests and handling post put and delete requests videos. The links will be in the description. Now, we need to handle this command. To do that, let's navigate to the handlers folder and create a new class. Let's name it add product handler. Again, this handler must inherit from the iRequest handler interface. And we have to provide two parameters the add product command as our command and the unit. When using mediator, instead of void, we use the unit struct that represents a void type. Now, Let's implement the interface. Here we are going to do the same thing we did with our previous handler. Let's create a private read-only fake data store fake data store field, implement a constructor and make it one liner. Additionally, we have to make our method async and await the fake data store dot add product method where we provide request.product as an argument. We also have to return unit.value. The value property is the default and only value for the unit read-only struct. With this out of the way, we can return to our controller. Let's add an HTTP POST attribute first. Then we're going to create a public async task action result action named add product. It accepts a single from body parameter of the product type and let's name it product. Now we have to use the send method again. So let's add await sender.send and provide a new add product command instance with our product that we receive in a request. Lastly, we will return the 201 status code as a result. 
Now, let's start the app in order to test it. In our Postman, we will create another post request with the same URI as for the previous one. We also have the headers added and the row body. Now let's send it. And we get a 201 created response. To verify this action, let's return to the previous request and send it. We can see all the products there. So everything is working great. Now, while this may seem simple in theory, let's try to think beyond the fact we are simply updating an in memory list of products. We are communicating to a data store via simple message constructs without having any idea of how it's being implemented. The commands and queries could be pointing to different data stores. They don't know how their request will be handled and they don't care. If we take a look in our post action, we can see that it just returns a 201 status code. But that is not enough most of the times. There is much better way of informing our client that this action succeeded. In order to do that, we have to create get product by ID action as well. Of course, before we do that, we have to create a new query record. So, let's navigate to the queries folder and create a new class and name it get product by ID query. Let's make it a record provide an int id parameter and it needs to inherit from the iRequest product interface. From this, we know that our query will return a single product as a result. Now, in the fake data store class, we have to add another method. Let's make it public async task product and name it get product by id. It will accept a single int id parameter and return a wait task from result where we fetch a single product from our products list with a single link you method. At this point, we can navigate to our controller and add a new action. We'll add a new HTTP GET attribute, but this time provide two parameters. The ID of type int as part of the URI and the name for this action, get product by ID. Next, let's create public async task action result get product by ID action with a single int id parameter. Inside the action, we'll create a product variable and await the sender.send method with a new get product by id query instance and id as an argument. Finally, we return OK with our product. With this in place, Let's open our add product command record. And let's add a new product parameter for the iRequest interface. Then we can navigate to the handler and replace unit with product here. Also for the return type. And finally, modify the return statement by calling request.product. Now we can navigate to the controller and modify our action. We'll add a new product to return variable to accept the result of the send method. And then instead of this return statement, we're going to call the created at route method and provide the get product by ID as the name of the action we are pointing to. Add a new anonymous object with a single ID property, which we assign from product to return dot ID. And finally, provide our product to return object as the last argument. Now let's start the app again. 
and use our previous post request one more time. We can see the 201 created result, but also we can see a newly created product in the response body. Additionally, in the headers tab, we can find the location property. Let's copy that URI and send the request. But this time we see an error message. If you closely read the message, you will see that it wants us to register our handler for this request. As we remember, for each query or command, we have to create the handler, but we didn't do it for this one. So let's get back to our project. Navigate to the handlers folder and create a new class. Let's name it get product by ID handler. It must inherit from I request handler. And we have to provide the query get product by ID query and the return type product. Now let's implement the interface. We also need our private read only fake date store, fake date store field, the constructor, and let's simplify it. And let's make this method async and return await fake date store get product by ID method with the request ID as an argument. We can simplify this one too. Now we can start the app. Send the post request again. And once the result is here, we can inspect the headers tab to see the location property. Let's switch to the get request. And once we send it, we can see the successful response. We will not implement the put or delete requests, since now you should be able to do it on your own. And it is a good for practice, of course. Just pay attention that usually put and delete actions don't return a value in the response body. Just a 204 status code. So create your commands and handlers accordingly. In our ultimate ASP.NET Core Web API book, we have a complete implementation alongside all the other Web API features. So if you would like to learn more, feel free to visit the books page. The link will be in the description below. Now let's continue towards the mediator notifications. So we've only seen a single request being handled by a single handler. However, what if we want to handle a single request by multiple handlers? That's where notifications come in. In these situations, we usually have multiple independent operations that need to occur after some event, for example, sending an email or invalidating a cache. To demonstrate this, we will update the add product command flow we created previously to publish a notification and have it handled by two handlers. Of course, sending an email and invalidating a cache is out of the scope of this video. But to demonstrate the behavior of notifications, let's instead simply update our fake values list to signify that something was handled. That said, let's open up our fake day store and add a new method. This will be a public async method returning task and name event occurred. Also, we will provide two parameters, the product product and the string event. Inside the body, let's use our product list and call the single method to extract a product from that list with the ID equal to the product ID parameter. And then set its name property to a custom string containing the product name value and the value of the event parameter. Lastly, let's await task.completed task. Now that we've modified our store, Let's create the notification and handlers. To do that, let's create a new folder. 
and name it notifications. Then create a new class and name it product added notification. Let's remove the parentheses and make it a record. Then let's add a product parameter. And finally, this record must inherit from the I notification interface. This is the equivalent of the I request we saw earlier, but for notifications. To continue, let's navigate to the handlers folder and create a new handler class. Let's name it email handler. This class must inherit from the I notification handler interface where we have to provide the product added notification. This is the notification record that our handler is going to handle. Let's implement the interface now. To continue, we're going to add a private read only fake date store fake date store variable and implement our constructor the same as before. Now let's make the method async and implement it with the await fake date store dot event occurred method and pass the notification dot product as a first argument and the custom email sent string as a second one. Also, we will wait task dot completed task. Next, let's navigate to the handlers folder again and create one more handler class named cache invalidation handler. Here, we will have almost the same implementation as with the previous handler. So let's inherit from the required interface, provide the needed parameter, and also implement an interface. Next, we need our private read-only fake data store field and a constructor. Finally, we can copy the implementation from the email handler class Paste it here, modify the string argument to cache invalidated and make this method async. That's all. To test this, let's navigate to the controller to modify the post action. But before we do actual modification, we have to use the iPublisher interface to publish our notifications. So let's add another private read only I publisher publisher field. Add a second I publisher parameter in the constructor. Cut this. Paste it into the body and initialize the publisher field. Now we can move on to the post action modification. Between these two lines, We'll add wait publisher dot publish and pass a new product added notification with the product to return as an argument. If you wanted to, we could have done this directly in the handler for add product command, but let's leave it here for simplicity. Now we can start our app. In Postman, let's first send the get request and we have our result. Next, let's run the post request. And as you can see, the name is not just test product for, but it has additions from both notifications. Now, of course, this is a simple example, but the key takeaway here is that we can fire an event and have it handled many times without the producer knowing any different. With the notifications implemented, in the final section, we'll talk about something called behaviors in Mediator. Often, when we build applications, we have many cross-cutting concerns. These include authorization, validating, and logging. Instead of repeating this logic throughout our handlers, we can make use of behaviors. Behaviors are very similar to ASP.NET Core middleware in that they accept a request, perform some action, 
and then optionally pass along the request. So let's see how to implement it. First, let's create another folder and name it behaviors. Also, we will add a new class here and name it logging behavior. We have to extend our class with two generic parameters, t request and t response. And then it has to inherit from the ipipeline behavior interface with the same t request and t response parameters. Now let's implement this interface. And add an additional constraint with the where t request inherits from i request t response. Next, we're going to add the logger in this class. To do that, let's add a private read only i logger, add the logging behavior t request t response as a parameter, and name it logger. Then we can create our constructor. After the constructor is ready, let's make our method async. Then with the help of the logger field, we will log information and provide a custom string handling type of t request and extract the name. Then let's create a response by awaiting the next delegate. And again, we will use the logger to log information with the custom string handled type of t response dot name. And finally, return a response. Now, in order to use this behavior class, we have to register it in the program class. We'll call builder.services.addSingleton method. And as a first parameter, we'll provide type of ipipeline behavior. And as a second parameter, we'll add type of logging behavior. Notice that we are using this notation to specify that the behavior can be used for any generic type parameters. To test this, let's run our application. Then let's open up Postman and run the get all products request. Now, if we inspect the command window, we can see some interesting messages. This is the logging output before and after our get products query handler was invoked. The important thing here is we didn't need to modify our existing requests or handlers. We simply added a new behavior and wired it up. So that's it. Please don't forget to hit those like and subscribe buttons down there if you liked the video and want to support us. You can also use the bell button to get notifications from our channel. Also, you can visit the CodeMess blog to download the source code and you can subscribe to our mailing list to get notified about our new content and videos. Thank you for watching and we'll see you again in another video. Until then, all the best.